Hey, what's up everybody? This is CLS All-in-One. In today's video, I'll show you how to change a water pump in a Ford V6 3.5 or 3.7 liter engine, years 2012 through 2019. This engine can be found in numerous Ford vehicle models, such as the Explorer, Edge, Flex, Taurus, Police Interceptor, and a couple Lincoln models as well. To determine if your water pump is indeed bad, I do have a video that covers that in the description down below. But basically what you're looking for is an antifreeze leak in the right front under the vehicle just below the AC compressor. If you happen to have a leak in this area, this is usually a strong indication that your water pump is bad. And here is a quick summary of the work involved. The top of the engine will need to be removed, including the air and fuel assemblies along with the valve covers. Then the timing chain cover on the right side of the engine will have to be removed, which will then give you access to the water pump, which is driven by the timing chain. So the water pumps in the past on the older engines used to be externally mounted on the front of the engine, which made them very simple to replace. But unfortunately, with the newer engines like this, they are far more difficult to replace. Okay, it's now time to get started. So first, I will go ahead and remove the engine cover, which is held on with just a couple plastic clips. And this next step is optional, but I like to go ahead and clean the engine and engine bay first before beginning any mechanical work, because this helps make the job cleaner and helps keep the internal engine parts from becoming contaminated with loose debris. And as you can see here now, my engine looks quite a bit cleaner. Having proper lighting for a job such as this is really important because there's a lot of steps involved that require a lot of detail. So I would recommend having at least one under the hood light, one shop light, and one floor light. And before beginning any mechanical work, I will go ahead and disconnect the car battery. Now the right front of the vehicle can be jacked up and supported with a jack stand. Then the right front wheel can be removed, which has a lug nut size of 19 millimeters. Next, the fender wheel well cover needs to be removed which is secured with various plastic clips and screws that are 5.5 and 8 millimeters in size. And when it comes to the plastic clips, more than likely there'll be a few that break and they will have to be replaced. And here is a look at the wheel well opening, which will be used to access various bolts and parts throughout this job. Now let's remove the air filter assembly, which is secured with clips and a band clamp and also has an electrical plug-in that will need to be unplugged. Next, I will loosen the spring clamp on this end of the engine coolant overflow hose with a pair of pliers and disconnect it. Then begin draining the coolant out of the radiator which has a drain valve at the bottom that can be opened by hand. And once the coolant is drained, I then begin draining the engine oil at the bottom of the oil pan by removing the drain plug that is 15 millimeters in size. And now it's time to disconnect this silver fuel line, which has a clip on the right side of the engine that can be removed fairly easy with just a small flat blade screwdriver. But on the left side of the fuel line, you will need a fuel line disconnect tool that presses into the female end of the line. During this step, some fuel will spill, so make sure to have some safety glasses on and a rag ready. Then the black fuel line needs to be disconnected and this can be done by loosening the green clips on both ends with a small flat blade screwdriver. Now the air intake assembly can be removed with an 8 millimeter socket. And there is one 8 millimeter bolt located at the bottom of this assembly that is somewhat hidden that will require a socket extension to reach. And right here is where that bolt is located. And located on the back and top of this assembly, there is two hoses that need to be disconnected which have a spring clamp that can be loosened with a pair of pliers. And there is also a couple of electrical connections that will need to be unplugged. Then after that, the assembly can be removed. And here is a look at the air inlet to the engine, which should be protected by covering this opening with rags or tape as shown here. 
Now it's time to start unplugging the main engine wire harness that connects to various parts such as the coil packs, fuel injectors, various sensors, grounding points, and more. The wire harness is also secured with various clips that are somewhat fragile. It may end up breaking and have to be replaced or repaired, which I'll cover later on in this video. In order to access a couple of the electrical connections, I ended up disconnecting this larger coolant hose on one end, which was secured with just a spring clamp. To unplug all of these connections, I found a pick and hook set worked well for me. The hardest connections to unplug ended up being at the fuel injectors because they were not very easy to access. After unplugging everything and unbolting the grounding points on this wire harness, I then pushed it to the side where it's clear from the top of the engine, and a couple of zip ties may come in handy here to keep this wire harness out of the way. Now I will start removing the three coil packs on the valve cover closest to the front of the vehicle, and these are secured with an 8mm bolt. After removing the bolt, the coil pack should just pull right up and out, but may require a little bit of force because they have a pretty tight fit. And here's a look at one of the coil packs. And inside the holes here, you can see where the spark plugs are located, which I will be changing later on in this video. Now let's remove this valve cover by pulling the oil dipstick and loosening the bolts, which are 10 millimeters in size. And a few of these will require a deep well socket. Once all the bolts are loosened, you may need to gently pry the valve cover up because the gasket may be keeping the valve cover sucked down in place. After gently prying on the valve cover, it should remove with ease, but the valve cover gasket may remain stuck to the engine. And here's a look at that gasket, and this should just peel right off with ease. And as long as this gasket is in good shape, I will be able to just clean it and reuse it. Now I will carefully clean the edges where the gasket was located using a rag with a cleaner sprayed on it such as brake cleaner. And when cleaning this edge I make sure to wipe everything to the outside of the valve opening because I don't want any loose debris falling inside this opening that could harm the engine. Then after cleaning the edges I like to cover this opening with a rag to keep it protected from anything else that could possibly fall inside this opening. Now it's time to move on to the next valve cover. So I will remove the coil packs first then loosen the bolts, then gently pry the valve cover, then remove the valve cover and gasket, then clean the edges and cover the opening. Next, the engine coolant reservoir located on the right wheel well will need to be removed by loosening two 8mm bolts. And it also has a Freon line that's clipped to the side of it that will have to be unclipped. Then the larger engine coolant hose on the bottom of the reservoir will need to be disconnected from the engine. And I was able to just use a couple of small flat blade screwdrivers on the white clip to disconnect the hose. Now let's remove the serpentine belt. To remove this, there is a belt tensioner pulley located on the right side of the engine with a 3 8 of an inch square opening that allows you to use a 3 8 ratchet to turn and pivot this tensioner and remove the belt. And here's a look at the tensioner from the bottom side. When it pivots, it goes this direction to loosen the belt. So I'm going to stick my 3 8 ratchet inside the square opening here. Then use a cheater bar or cheater pipe with my ratchet so I can get some extra leverage. Then turn the tensioner clockwise to start loosening the belt. And once the belt is loose, I can unhook it from the alternator location. Then let go of the tension on the tensioner. Then from the bottom side, I can go ahead and remove the belt all the way. Now it's time to remove the crankshaft pulley. And for this, I'll be using a heavy duty impact drill along with an 18 millimeter socket and a universal puller to remove the pulley. After removing the bolt, I will then use a slightly smaller bolt and place it inside the hole which will give the puller something to press against when removing the pulley. And here's a look at the universal puller I will be using that I purchased from Harbor Freight. So this just hooks to the inside edges of the pulley. Then when you turn the bolt on the puller clockwise, it begins removing the pulley, which is pressed on very tightly and can be very hard to remove. 
And I did make this look fairly easy, but it did take me a couple of tries to get this puller to hook on there just right and not slip and actually remove the pulley. And here is a look at the front main engine oil seal that is attached to the timing chain cover. And I will be replacing this later on in the video. Now it's time to start removing the engine mount located on the top right side right here. But before doing this, the engine will need to be supported with something else first. For this, I'll be using a floor jack and a block of wood. Then I'll start jacking underneath the oil pan until the engine just barely begins to move. Then I will measure and cut a piece of wood and place it under the other block to lock it in place and keep it from possibly lowering unintentionally. And here's a look at that block of wood I cut to lock this in place. And now I can go ahead and start removing the four nuts on the engine mount using an impact drill with a 15 millimeter extra deep well socket. Then remove the three bolts, which are 18 millimeters in size. And now the engine mount should just pull right out. And now the belt tensioner can be removed by loosening the three 8mm bolts. So here's what it looks like after removing it, and here's a look at the belt tensioner. Now it's time to start removing the bolts on the timing chain cover, starting with the six at the top, which are 10 millimeters in size. And on this cover, there's multiple other bolts with different sizes, including eight millimeter, 10 millimeter, 13 millimeter, and 15 millimeter. So here's a look at one of the six bolts at the top, and now I just have five more to remove. And located right here is a hidden bolt that is hard to see and must be removed. And I believe this is an eight millimeter bolt. Here is a closer look at it. And I have heard of a lot of people forgetting or not noticing this bolt. Then when they try to pry the timing chain cover off, it ends up breaking. Now let's take a look at the bottom side of the timing chain cover through the well well opening, where you can access a good amount of the bolts that need to be removed. So on this cover, there is 22 bolts on the outside edges that will need to be removed and four bolts on the inside that will also have to be removed. And for the bolts located closer to the top, there's a Freon or AC line that is bolted to the back of the wheel well opening. They can be unbolted and pushed to the side so the timing chain bolts can be accessed easier. And for some of the bolts located to the inside of the cover that are a little bit longer, you may have to jack the engine up or lower the engine in order for the bolt to clear the frame. Now I will continue removing the remaining bolts on the bottom half of this cover. And here is a look at the timing chain cover after removing all the bolts. Now it's time to start prying off this cover and there is various pry points that can be used but it should not take an extreme amount of force to remove this because the only thing holding this on here is just a thin layer of silicone which acts as a gasket for this cover. So here is a pry point for the right side and here is one for the left side. Then up on the top in the middle right here there is a pry point and there's also a couple pry points on the top outside corners as well. If the cover still does not come loose after prying in all these areas, you may need to use a thin putty knife to cut through some of the gasket and then it should pop loose. But you will want to be very careful when trying something like this and avoid damaging the metal because that could cause issues later on when you try to get this timing chain cover to seal. And as you can see here, the cover pulled right out but it did take a little bit of wiggling to get this out of there. And here is a closer look at the cover, which will need to be cleaned before reinstalling. And here is a look at the water pump right here in the middle, which is driven by the timing chain. So the chain will have to be removed from the water pump before the pump can be removed. But before I mess with the timing chain, I'm gonna go ahead and start cleaning the gasket material off where the timing cover was attached. When cleaning areas of the engine that have exposed internal parts such as this, 
you'll want to avoid using power tools with abrasive gasket removing attachments like this because the debris that spreads from these could possibly enter into the engine and possibly cause damage to your engine as well. So instead, to be on the safer side, you should just use some hand gasket scrapers such as these, along with some gasket removing spray. Or you could just use a brake cleaner spray as well. So here is a picture before scraping the gasket, and here is after. So I have the bottom all nice and clean, and now I just need to finish the top, which is going to take a while. After fully removing the gasket, I then thoroughly flushed this entire area with an engine cleaner, and for this brake cleaner worked well. And during this step, I also made sure to have my oil catch pan under the oil pan to catch any fluid. And you will want to use what seems like an excessive amount of cleaner, because you need to make sure no debris remains, which could possibly plug the oil pump and cause engine damage. And it would also be a good idea to flush out the top of the engine as well. Now it's time to clean the timing chain cover and a hand scraper can be used again, but since this is an external solid part that is separated from the engine, I can go ahead and use a power tool with an abrasive gasket removing attachment, such as this light duty wire wheel. But you will want to be careful when using something like this, because if you stay in one spot for too long, you may end up wearing down the metal. Next, I will thoroughly spray the cover with some engine degreaser, then scrub it down, then clean it off with some brake cleaner, then wipe it down. Now it's time to start removing the timing chain, and for this I'll be using a special tool that is designed to lock your camshafts in place, which keeps the timing of your engine aligned properly. So these are made out of a thick solid steel, and this also comes with an adjustment tool so you can adjust the tension on the timing chain tensioner. These place on top of the camshafts in this area here, but before I can place these in position, the cams will need to be aligned in the correct position first, and the small U-shaped tubing will also need to be removed on both sides of the engine, and I believe these are used for feeding engine oil. And these just have three 8mm bolts that need to be loosened in order to remove these tubes. So here is a closer look at the U-shaped tubing and they are slightly different for each side. Now it's time to test fit one of the cam locks, and it looks like it's pretty close, but I will need to turn the crankshaft slightly to get this to seat all the way down and lock the camshafts. So down inside the wheel well opening, I have threaded the pulley bolt onto the end of the crankshaft so I can turn it with a breaker bar and an 18 millimeter socket. And what worked for me with this engine is that when this dot is in approximately the 4 o'clock position, it aligns the camshafts very close to where they need to be. Now let's head back up to the top, and located on the camshaft gear pulleys, there's also a couple of dots, and for me these lined up at approximately the 11 o'clock position on the left, and 1 o'clock on the right. And these dots are also lined up pretty closely with some brass colored bolts that are directly above them. Now I will try placing the cam lock in position again, and this time it is super close. When these are in the correct position, the lock should fit flush against the engine, but as shown here highlighted in yellow, there is still a very small gap. So I will go ahead and turn the crankshaft back just a very minor amount. Now let's try again, and as you can see here, it now sits flush, and the other side should fit flush as well because the two sides are aligned with each other. But that being said, you may still have to barely, barely turn that crankshaft to find the exact sweet spot for these two locks to both fit flush. And to keep the cam locks from tipping over and falling out of position, I just used a couple of the bolts from the U-shaped oil tubes and place them in the hole closest to the locks, but I did not thread these. I just let them rest in the hole at an angle as shown here. Now these locks will stay in position and keep my engine timing safe. 
And just for fail safe, I've also marked the timing chain with a white paint marker where the dots are located. And I've also made a mark on the rail located right behind the gear pulleys. So I did the same thing on both sides. And that mark on the rail is in line with the dot and mark on the chain. And I also made a mark on the chain at the bottom at the crankshaft where the dot is located and made a mark just behind it as well. Now the timing chain tensioner and guide can be removed. Here is a look from the top and here is a look from the bottom. So this has two 8mm bolts that need to be removed and there is a little bit of tension on this but I can remove this without the use of any special tools but when I do reinstall this I will need to use the tension adjustment tool. And right here I'm about to remove the second bolt and since there is tension on this you will need to keep a hold of the part so it doesn't fall like this and you can also hold on to the chain during this step as well and that'll ease some of that tension. Now the guide for the tensioner should just pull right out and during these steps you'll want to inspect the guides and timing chain to make sure there's no excess wear on any of these parts and if there is you should just go ahead and replace them. But for my vehicle all the parts seem to be in pretty good shape so I will just be reusing them. Next I will remove the chain guide on the opposite side by loosening two 8mm bolts. Now this should just pull right out and here's a closer look at this guide. Next, I will readjust the chain and remove it from the water pump, but leave the rest of the chain in place because I will not be replacing it. Now, I can begin to loosen this third chain guide right here. And this one is kind of a pain to get to, but it can be done with a small 8mm end wrench. But for extra leverage, I did have to use a second wrench because this bolt was fairly tight. Now, because there is a gear pulley right in front of this guide, I was not able to fully remove it, only loosen it. But this does give me just enough clearance now to be able to remove the water pump. Now I can begin loosening the eight 8 millimeter bolts on the water pump. So all of the bolts are now removed and the only thing holding this in place is the gasket on the water pump. So now I will need to start prying the pump loose with the two pry points shown here at the top. And there's also one at the bottom as well. And while prying from the bottom here, I will go ahead and just let this fully drain first before removing the water pump. And after prying just a little bit more from the top, the pump is now ready to remove. Now let's take a closer look at the water pump. And here is some info about what happens when the pump goes bad. Located on the back is a chamber circled here in yellow. When the pump starts to fail, it's designed to start leaking coolant into this chamber, which then leaks to a chamber on the inside of the engine where the water pump mounts. Then from here, the coolant flows through this chamber to the bottom of the engine, where it then ends up leaking in between the AC compressor in the oil pan. Now I need to clean the surface where the water pump was mounted and for this I'll use a gasket scraper and some brake cleaner. And here's what it looks like after being cleaned. Now let's take a look at the new water pump. So I was going to just replace this pump with the same exact OEM pump but unfortunately they did not have it in stock so instead I chose to use a premium rated water pump made by CarQuest with a lifetime warranty. The new pump looks very close to the original. The main difference between the two is the gasket on the new one comes in two pieces, which presses into grooves on the pump fairly easy. As far as the quality of this pump goes, only time will tell, but I'll be sure to leave updates on my video if the pump gives me any issues. And just like the original pump, this does have two pins on the back that line up with holes on the engine where the water pump mounts, which helps keep the pump in the correct position when tightening the bolts. Now I will place the water pump in position and this can be a little bit tricky because of the guide being in the way. Once in position, I then begin installing the eight 8mm bolts 
and when tightening the bolts I use a crisscross pattern and torque them to 8 foot pounds. Now I will go ahead and spray the engine again with cleaner to flush out any remaining engine coolant left from the water pump removal. Now this guide can be tightened with one 8mm bolt and 8 foot-pounds of torque. Then this chain guide can be installed with the two 8mm bolts and 8 foot-pounds of torque. Then the chain can be routed back around the water pump and lined up in the same exact position that it was before using the white paint markings that I made earlier. Then the chain tensioner guide can be installed, which just slides over a pin that holds it in place, along with the chain tensioner, which will be installed next. Now the tensioner needs to be adjusted, and for this I'm using a pair of channel lock pliers to compress it, and a small Allen wrench. But you can also use the adjustment tool that comes with the cam lock kit, but I found that this Allen wrench is easier to use because it's smaller. So after compressing the tensioner, I then place the allen wrench in the larger hole on the right to unlock it and press down what I'm going to call the foot. Then I will place the allen wrench in the smaller hole on the left to lock the tensioner in place. And now I can release the grip on the pliers and this is ready to install. So the tensioner secures right here with two 8mm bolts and the torque on these should also be 8 foot pounds. Now I will firmly press the chain and guide against the tensioner with one hand, then remove the allen wrench with my other hand, then slowly release the pressure against the chain until the tensioner tightens up all the slack in the chain. Now this chain is fully tightened and it's in the exact same position that it was to start with because it's lined up perfectly with all the marks that I made earlier. Once the timing chain is in position and secure, the cam locks can then be removed. Then the U-shaped oil pickup tubes can be installed on both sides with the three 8mm bolts torqued at 8 foot-pounds. Now it's time to replace the front main crankshaft oil seal that is attached to the timing chain cover. So this one is not in terrible shape, but because this is such a giant job changing the water pump, it's worthwhile just going and changing the seal because this part is fairly easy to do. For tools, you can use a larger socket that is the same size as the seal, or use a seal driver kit such as this. I will demonstrate first using a socket on the back side of the cover that just barely fits in the hole. Then if I tap this down with a hammer, it'll push the seal right out. When doing this, you'll want to make sure the cover is supported with something such as blocks of wood to avoid any damage to the cover. After removing the seal, I then lightly scrub the hole and clean it and wipe it off. Now the seal can be placed in position on the top side of the cover and driven down with a socket or a seal driver as I will demonstrate here. This kit comes with multiple adapters so you can match the correct size of your seal. So now I will just tap the seal down until the solid portion of the seal with the dots is flush as shown here. Then I will lubricate the inside of this seal with an engine oil that matches my vehicle. Then with the same engine oil, I will start lubricating some of the internal engine parts, such as the timing chain and gears. And I found that a toothbrush works well for applying the oil. Next, I will use some rubbing alcohol to clean all the edges where the timing chain cover will attach, and also wipe down the timing chain cover edges as well. Now it's time to start applying the gasket maker, and for this I'm using Permatex Ultra Black Gasket Maker. The gasket can be applied to either the engine side or the timing cover itself, but I found that it was harder to apply the gasket maker to the cover 
because it kept wiping off any time I bumped into anything which is very hard to avoid when placing it into position. So I chose to apply it on the engine side. And when applying the gasket maker, you want to be very thorough to get all areas where there needs to be a gasket. And you'll want to try not to exceed a one quarter of an inch wide bead to avoid excessive squeeze out. Now I will carefully place the cover in position and avoid coming in contact with any of the gasket maker until it's in the correct position. The cover does feature a couple of holes that will line up with pins on the engine and this will help with holding it in the proper place while securing it with bolts. And here's a quick look at the two holes on the cover that line up with pins on the engine. So I just about got this lined up with the pins and now it is in position. Now this is ready to secure with bolts and there should be 26 bolts in total for this cover. 22 on the outside edges and four on the inside face of the cover. When tightening the bolts, I like to use a crisscross pattern and to start with, all of the bolts will need to be torqued to eight foot pounds. Then all the outside perimeter bolts can be torqued a little more to 15 foot pounds plus an additional 45 degree turn. Then the three inside larger bolts can be torqued to 15 foot pounds plus a 90 degree turn. Then the smaller hidden bolt on the inside can be turned an additional 45 degrees. But depending on what gasket maker you are using, you may need to wait before you make the final torque on the bolts. The gasket maker I use recommends to torque the bolts first to eight foot pounds, then wait one hour before making the final torque. And per the instructions for this gasket maker, it also states that you should wait 24 hours for this to fully cure before adding any fluids to the vehicle. Now the engine mount can be installed, which secures with three larger 18 millimeter bolts and four 15 millimeter nuts. And the bolts should be torqued to 66 foot pounds and the nuts should be torqued to 46 foot pounds. And now the jack that was supporting the engine can be removed. Then the belt tensioner can be installed with the three eight millimeter bolts that should be torqued to eight foot pounds. Then this air conditioner line can be bolted back to the frame of the vehicle. And I believe this is 10 millimeters. Now the crankshaft pulley can be pressed back on the crankshaft and the bolt might not be long enough to reach the threads. So you might have to drive the pulley down just a little bit with a large socket and a small sledge as shown here. And after just a couple of taps, the bolt can now reach the thread. And now when I tighten the bolt, it will press the pulley back on this shaft. After the pulley is fully seated, the torque should be adjusted to 37 foot-pounds, followed by a 90 degree turn. Next, it's time to reattach the serpentine belt. So I need to use my ratchet to loosen the tension on the belt tensioner. Then I will use a block of wood to hold it in place, then slide the belt back on, then release the tensioner. Next, I need to clean up any excess gasket material that may have squeezed out where the valve covers rest. And for this, I'll use a razor blade and just cut the excess off flush. Then before installing the valve covers, I will pour a little bit of engine oil inside the valve openings, including the timing chain area as well. And now the valve covers can be bolted on just make sure the press on gaskets are clean and attached to the valve covers. Then the bolts should be tightened in a crisscross pattern. And since the spark plugs are exposed and due for replacement, I will go ahead and replace them using a 5 8 deep well socket. Here is a look at one of the current plugs, which looks a little rough. And here is one of the new plugs, which will need to be gapped to 50. Now this plug is ready to install and will need to be torqued to 12 foot pounds. Then for the rest of the remaining five plugs, I just repeat the same steps. Next, the coil packs can be installed. These just slide right into the hole and plug into the spark plugs. Then each one is secured with an eight millimeter bolt that should be torqued to five foot pounds. Mm -hmm. 
Now the main wire harness for the engine can be reconnected, which secures with clips on and around the valve covers. Then the wire connections plug into the coil packs, fuel injectors, cam sensors, and various other components. And there's also a couple grounding points as well. For any areas where the clips broke on the wire harness, you could use a high heat zip tie such as this one here, which I used in this location right here. And I also used these same metal zip ties to repair some of the broken clips that attached to the valve cover bolts by routing these zip ties through the remaining part of the clip like this. Now I can place this on the top of the valve cover bolt, then fasten the tie around the wire harness as shown here. Now the air intake assembly can be installed, but first I need to remove the tape on the engine air intake and make sure the surface is clean. Then bolt the assembly in place using an eight millimeter socket and eight foot pounds of torque. And don't forget about the hidden bolt located under the assembly. Then the electrical connections can be plugged in and the smaller hoses can be connected. Next, the fuel lines can be connected, starting with the silver one. This side should just push right into place, and on the other side it will push into place, then secure with a clip. Then bolt in place right here. Then the black fuel line can be connected, which just pushes in place and locks with a clip on both sides. Then this line secures to the silver line with these clips here. Now the engine coolant reservoir can be secured to the vehicle with two 8mm bolts. Then the AC line can be clipped back in place. Then the coolant overflow line can be connected with the spring clamp. Then the larger coolant hose at the bottom of the reservoir can be connected which just pushes right into place and locks with a clip. Then the large coolant line on the left side of the engine bay can be connected and this secures in place with a large spring clamp. Now the air filter assembly can be installed which connects to the upper air intake with a large band clamp and a smaller push on hose. Then the air filter housing slides into place and secures with clips. Then the electrical connector can be plugged in and the valve cover hose can be connected. Next, I will remove the oil filter, then fill a new oil filter with oil to prevent the engine from having a dry start. Then install the new filter, which should be hand tightened and turned an additional half turn with an oil filter wrench. Then install the oil pan drain plug which should be torqued to 20 foot-pounds. Then close the coolant antifreeze drain at the bottom of the radiator. Now I can begin adding the fluids starting with 5W20 engine oil and the capacity for this engine is 6 quarts. Then I will start adding the coolant and just fill the reservoir all the way to the top for now and I will have to add more once the engine is running. And now it's time for a test, so I will hook the battery up and start the vehicle. So this is just a test start. I just want to make sure there's no crazy sounds coming from the engine and make sure there's no leaks happening as well. And everything looks good here, but I'm going to go ahead and leave the wheel well cover off for now and just bolt on the wheel and take this outside and let it run for a while and top off the coolant as well. And after that, if there's no leaks, I'll put the wheel well cover back on. So to add more coolant, I need to let the engine heat up with the heater set to high and the cap off the reservoir. And once the coolant thermostat opens up, it will start to draw the coolant from the reservoir and also purge the air out as well. The total coolant capacity I believe is around four gallons, but the engine should have some remaining in it. So the full four gallons may not be needed. And while I'm waiting for the engine to heat up, 
I will continue to check for leaks from any areas of the engine I worked on. So everything looks good from the top here. Now let's go ahead and take another look at the bottom. And I do not see any issues, so that's good. And now it looks like the thermostat has opened up, so it's time to start adding more coolant. And you will probably have to top this reservoir off to the fill line multiple times as the engine purges the air out and draws more coolant in. Then once the coolant finally stays at the full line, the cap can then be screwed on. Now I will install the wheel well cover. To secure this, it uses screws and multiple types of plastic fasteners. And when I removed this, a lot of the fasteners ended up breaking. So I did have to find some replacements to get this back together. And here's a quick look at some of the areas where this does secure. Some of these clips actually have a plastic screw to fasten them, but others just push in place as shown here. Then after installing this cover, the wheel can be bolted on in a crisscross pattern with 100 foot-pounds of torque. And now I am finally at the last step, which is putting the engine cover back on. And this is really easy to do. It just slides over the oil fill cap, then secures with a plastic bolt on the left side and a push-in plastic fastener on the right side. Okay, it's now time for me to go. Hopefully this video will help you out with this giant job of changing a water pump on a Ford V6 engine like this one. And if you like this video, if you could hit that like button and please subscribe. And have yourself a great day, and I'll see you next time.